watch the yeah. <laughs> hey we're in Tall ones. That's all. Hey, Miss Nora. How you doing? Where's the uh? <laughs> Should I sit right here? You want me to sit on it? Oh no, this is if I like.
testing. Nancy, I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Bertie. I work with Robin too. Yes. And I'm still out of my head. Hi, Robin. Hi, Robin.
Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Selena Edmondson. I am uh, one of the organizers for this story of seminar. We are so excited to come here to begin this year long series on immigration, race, and inequality. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time up here, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our wonderful, transformative chancellor, Dr. Nancy Cantor, to give the welcome. Good So I am absolutely delighted to say a few words of welcome to this terrific Sawyer Seminar series funded by the Andrew Mellon Foundation begins. And I want to first congratulate Belinda, Sean, Cornell, Bernie for their creativity and commitment in conceiving and bringing to fruition this timely seminar. As we sit today amidst the flood of anti-immigrant sentiment, undergirded by rampant racism and xenophobia, and sustained by vicious hitting of communities by race, religion, language, and heritage. We live in a time in the reminiscence of the nativism of Nazism, when white supremacist chant Jews will not replace us on a college campus. A time when that nativism is transported to distinguish real white America, a group whose heritage has broadened over decades to include the Jews and Italians and Irish, once excluded as in Europe, and to contrast them with a broad collection of others. A collection of others that covers a wide diaspora, as you all know, full, sadly but inevitably, of its own inner group conflict. For example, within diaspora communities of other issues such as religion, class, language, and of color. We witnessed the horrendous targeting and beating of Asian Americans under the guise of blame for a global pandemic. And then we watched as a governor of a state that once welcomed Cuban refugees, albeit a specific type of uses blatant trickery to transport Venezuelan refugees seeking asylum recovered under GPS to another state where apparently people need to stay there. Indeed, to borrow a phrase from my fellow social psychologist, Rupert Nacons, our hibernating bigotry is not hibernating. And it knows no geographic boundaries. It shows no shame in assigning a diverse <laughs> and it knows no geographic boundaries. It shows no shame or assigning a diverse membership to the other, repeating the sins of historical exclusion and racist discrimination, as if we haven't learned a thing. From Native American genocide and planning slavery and returning to the food box, forced internment of Asian Americans, and the list of social support. Now, as the title of this seminar series, Natives and Nativists, Migrants and Immigrants in an American City, suggests, we add the dimension of urbanization, as so much of the world's population now reside in urban centers that carry their own history up to this day of exclusion, transition, gentrification and displacement, vibrant perseverance and persistent systemic racism. And this brings us to New York, New Jersey's largest city, one that to this day, as Ryan Hager and our partners at the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice say, exemplifies what MLK meant by two Americans calling on us all to say the word reparation we think about what imperative justice is. Indeed, I would say there cannot be a more relevant emblematic place for this seminar's critical and timely dialogue to be held than right here, a 350-plus-year-old global city where from 
its very start, the complexities of the all too simple bodies of native and nativist, migrant, and immigrants, the shape that settled colonialists overran the Lenape culture, beginning with a repeatedly flawed narrative about rightful ownership. A narrative then repeated across centuries of migration and immigration up to this very day, setting the stage for the related and equally contested and complex territory of who really belongs. This is a city brought to life by waves of African descended families migrating to South Africa, riding in many cases the underground railroad to freedom, moving through what is now our Rutgers New York Center, South of New York City, only to land in the last northern state to abolish slavery in 1866. Then came multiple generations of immigrants migrating here, from Jews and Italians and Irish challenging native conceptions of whiteness, to New York's Chinatown, growing on Mulberry Street starting in the late 1870s rising up until the depression and declared dead by newspaper headlines in 1950. And central to the evolving complexion and complexity of this global city, of course, are decades upon decades of highly diverse populations in it from the global south, including, for example, those 73,000 labeled in the census as born in Latin America. Covering again a wide span of geography from Brazil and Ecuador to the Dominican Republic and beyond, and often presumed, sometimes incorrectly, to be Grand Islanders, or those coming from Africa and the Caribbean, who are distinguished from their African American neighbors, complicating the reduction of a black city. Likewise, among the 108,000 New York residents labeled in the U.S. Census as born outside of the United States, we are challenged to reach beyond yet another reduction of understanding of New York's 6,500 residents labeled, labeled as born in Asia, which occupies similarly the broader array of ethnicities, religions, social classes, and cultural traditions of the first generation residents of our city of New York. Indeed, movement in and out of New York has defined its soul and culture and economic trajectory, especially in the Black and Puerto Rican rebellions of 1967 and 1974, respectively, they cover the decades of so called white flight, which included many of the successful residents of New York's former Chinatown, and dispersed to New Jersey's many suburbs. In turn, these movements in and out of New York turn New Jersey's largest city, on the one hand, into a diverse mecca for nuanced and vibrant cultural, linguistic, and religious representation, and on the other hand, a transportation hub for thousands of suburban, mostly white, employees of Fortune 500 companies and universities and hospitals commuting in and then out of New York every day. Yes, in so many ways, as our dear late city historian and revered representative colleague from Christ always said, and I quote, all roads lead to the Holy Spirit. And I echo that sentiment today in order to emphasize the dynamic the landscape is and has always been, even as the external labeling is typically reductionistic, glossing over the ever present story. Characteristics of New York's residents and the communities who populate the most urban space. Nevertheless, at the heart of so much of the tension of urbanization, evident in North and other comparable cities, is the age old question of who owns the city? To whom does it belong? Alongside the question of who profits from its economy versus who has built its soul. Who owns New York? Who owns America? As simple as the question may seem, 
I see it as the door to be opened as this seminar considers the fundamental tension of race, inequality, and immigration that confront us and animate us all so urgently today. And as scholars and students at Rutgers North have been studying and living for decades, I see it in the questions that our undocumented students are truly asked as we work to ensure their belonging is here. I hear it in the voices of our 480 or more students speaking 48 languages in the lines and translation program, working in the immigration rights field, and in contact tracing for so years. I watch it in the multimedia stories of the North Americans, produced as the story book travels the neighborhoods of the world, the maps make maps that connect local to global in the Mediterranean displacement of race. I move to it in the dead poetry of Neil's legacy of our creative writing faculty and students in our Institute of Black Studies Archives, collaborate with them to attack their music city base, reminding us of sounds and words exactly who has been in the world of soul life. And speaking of being in and of Newark, I nod my head and heart to our public historians working to underscore the rightful presence of the Underground Railroad in Newark as our socially engaged artists define the sights and sounds of the new main Harriet Public Square after the removal of the public square. Again, reminding us of centuries of conflict over who owns and who belongs. And speaking of ownership and belonging and urbanization, I read with sadness the latest report from our crime scholars entitled Who Owns Newark, documenting the destructive influence of outside investors, buying up new homes and displacing real new groups by charging exorbitant rents. Yes, the story of systemic racism created to America goes way back in the city of New York. As our scholars in the inclusion project studying school segregation by race and class remind us that New Jersey has the sixth most segregated public school in the country. And as we see in every corner of every neighborhood, in our crafty democratic teaching project, a collaboration between our public historians and community partners at the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice, Newark and ACG, and the Newark Community Development Network, committed to the campaign to save the world for reparations and restorative justice, which must be spoken as part of this dialogue, too. I mention all of these ways that we interrogate with so many angles, disciplines, viewpoints, and communities as this series will do the pressing question and now, but rooted in this question of how and why and to what end have we pitted and reduced, treated so many people under the rubric of discriminating between and among those seen as belonging and those to whom the door of equitable growth is closed. Having these conversations will sometimes be difficult and always challenging as we confront distant past and equally fraught present. Yet as this series goes forth and complicates the binaries of natives and nativists, migrants and immigrants, it will also possibly open some doors to a better way to answer the question of who owns and what owns, a way perhaps that is more genuinely represented the American ethos that we still retain, even as that course today is a long way off. In this regard, I turn to a quote from Frederick Douglass that Eva Patel used to begin his book, Out of Many Faiths, Religious Diversity in the American Mind. In the words of Frederick Douglass, quote, there is but one destiny left for us. That is to make ourselves and be made by others a part of the American people in every sense of the word. 
I see the dialogue between fear as answers, and it is that question. How can we be us and still be we? Fear. Thank you for this seminar. Um, I have a very great pleasure today uh, to introduce our speakers. Um, Kathy Park Hong is one of the most important voices in Asian American studies today. She is a brilliant poet and essayist whose writing uh, has appeared in The Guardian, The New York Times, and, the, and Salon, among other media outlets. Kathy is the author of a best selling Minor Feelings and Asian American Reckoning. She's a tour de force book of essays, I highly recommend everybody read, on the Asian American experience, which won the National Book Critics Circle Award and was a finalist uh, final for the Pulitzer Prize. Um, she's been on the cover of Time. She, there's a huge spread of her in what New York Magazine does today. She's awesome. Uh, she is a luminous presence in the English department here at Rutgers Newark, where she co directs the MFA program. I'm proud to call her my colleague. Welcome, Kathy. <laughs> May Nye is a renowned historian who examines issues of immigration, citizenship, nationalism, and the Chinese diaspora. She teaches at Columbia University, where she is the Lung Family Professor of Asian American Studies and Professor of History. An essayist has written for the Washington Post, the New York Times, the LA Times, and the Atlantic, among other outlets. Professor Nye is the author of several award-winning books, among these Impossible Subjects, Illegal Aliens in the Making of Modern America, The Lucky Ones, One Family, and The Extraordinary Invention of Chinese America, and The Chinese Question, The Gold Rushes, and Global Politics. And currently, she's working on Nation of Immigrants, a short history of an idea which is under contract with Princeton University Press. She also has an amazing essay out in the Atlantic right now, I believe. Again, if you don't know the work, go and read. Of particular interest for me and for our community here in Newark is that Professor Nye did not go directly to college. Before becoming an historian, she was a labor union organizer and an educator in New York City, where when she finally enrolled in college, she did not go to a wealthy private institution, but to Empire State College, part of the SUNY system. Professor Nye, in other words, could have been a student here at Newark. She is a testament to public education as a public good. I'm thrilled that she is here with us today. Welcome, Professor. Nye. Moderating the talk between uh, uh, Kathy and May will be Professor Rose Quizon Villazor, who specializes in immigration law here in Newark at the Rutgers Law School, where she is the interim dean. She has written op eds for the New York Times and appeared on CNN and other media outlets. She's the founding director of our Center for Immigration Law, Policy, and Social Justice, a very important uh, center for the kind of transformative work we need to do here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, May and Kathy. Thank you so much for being here today. So I have the privilege of moderating this panel, and it's really my job to feature the incredible work that both Kathy and May are doing. So uh, let's begin. 
Um, why don't we just start first, generally talking about how you see your own role in, in education and in public life. Thank you. Well, first, um, thank you for having me. Thanks to uh, Belinda and Cornell and Sarah Durs, and thank you, Anna Cantor. It's a real pleasure to be here. Let me just first say that when you say my role as an educator or a researcher and in public life, those are two things that don't go easily together necessarily. And, um, and I think of myself more as a former, as, as a scholar. Um, but as a scholar and as a citizen, you know, we have a responsibility to the public good. But that's not always comfortable. It's not always easy to do. Um, I was reading this fabulous profile of Kathy in New York um, yesterday, and, she, and it described her as a reluctant, reluctant pundit. And I, I understand that. I totally get that. Um, I personally am suspicious of the either of it, so I think, that, um, but I think, you know, we, we need to try to bring what we can to, to the public conversation. So, um, you know, that world of journalism or op-ed, you know, moves in a different rhythm. You know, you take, I took a decade to write a book. You want something in the time, you have to write it last night. So it's a very different kind of um, thing, but to balance those things, I think, is also always a challenge for us. Hi. Um, first of all, uh, thank you, Sawyer, uh, the uh, conference, and Belinda, and uh, Cornell, and Rose, and everyone who helped organize this. And I have to say, it's really a special treat to be here on stage with May, who is absolutely seminal. Uh, in Asian American studies as both a scholar and as an activist. And um, I don't know where she would be today without me and her work. So it's an honor to be here. Um, I don't, um, yeah, I do, I also hesitate from um, this idea of having a role. You know, I, have, I constantly emphasize that um, I'm a poet. So I went to graduate school as a poet that, you know, um, poets are used to having no audience, you know, <laughs> and like, and um, the Greek poets have no cultural capital. Uh, but you know, um, but what poets do are, uh, uh, you know, they are they allow readers to be wakeful, uh, be aware of what language can do and how it could, uh, and to make us more sensitive to the world around us. I mean, that's what writers do. And so that has always been my motivation now, if we are to kind of think about it within the realm of Asian American studies and race studies and so forth. Um, you know, for me, as I would say, like uh, as a, you know, a literary activist or advocate, for me, it was really important to kind of um, um, unpack the canon and point to other forms of, of literature that have been hidden uh, by Western hegemony and, and so forth. And, um, you know, Nate Mackey talks about uh, the, you know, how uh, people who have been othered, you know, are. Uh, poets who have been othered have made a lot of innovation, like quote unquote othering language, othering literature. And I've always been specialized in that. That is quite different from being thrust on the spotlight as uh, after minor feelings came out, where people have expected me to have uh, be a talking head and have my thoughts on um, anti Asian hate and so forth. And, um, I think, you know, uh, in the 24 hour news cycle, people just want to put that opinion to click. Um, uh, they need content, content, content. And I think it's very important that, uh, and for me, I'm not accustomed to that and I tend to bristle at that, but I also think it's really important um, 
for Asian Americans, uh, myself, but also everyone to, to kind of take over the platform and speak up and speak out and, um, you know, act as a corrective against sort of uh, the, Arab media, or, you know, or, uh, and so forth, and because no one else is going to do it, and that's what I realized is that no one else is going to do it, but we have to do it ourselves. Uh, so that is, I guess, sometimes my my reluctant role, <laughs> I guess, when I do speak, uh, when I take on a public role. Well, that does make sense, though. So I remember uh, during the the Trump administration, um, because of the. Uh, multiple anti-immigrant laws that were passed and regulations that were passed. There were a lot of, there were protests, there were um, many discussions in the news. And here at, at Rutgers, many of us who write in this area, uh, like the two of you, were, were called to by CNN, New York Times, to participate. And on the one hand, visibility is so important. We need to go out there. We need to share our story. But on the other hand, there's also um, this drawing from the reluctance theme that I'm hearing. Um, we have to do it. Um, it's an, in some ways, it's an obligation to do so. But then there's a part of it that you know that it, it can be burdensome. But at least the way I see it, it is. Uh, I agree with what you're saying, Kathy. It's part of what we need to do in order to go out there and share views. Right. And we, do you agree with that? I, I would say that we. We actually bring something very special to public conversation. We bring our expertise. And a lot of people who are talking heads or who are on the news actually are very shallow in the knowledge that they have or their polemicists. And I think what we bring is a very a deep knowledge that may not be obvious in the sound bite or in the short little column we write. But I think what we bring to bear in the conversation is something that makes people think, right? Either through, um, in your case, right, your mastery of language, right, and then how you can deconstruct bad language, right? Because if you, that's what, that's the other side of it, right? If you're great at writing and, and you love and understand language, um, then you can really unpack bad language. And I think what historians bring to the table is a deep knowledge of how we got here um, and how we can, we can actually learn from the past. And in some ways, I think where the burden becomes more worrisome is when we are expected to be prescriptive. I don't have the answers, right? We don't have all the answers, but we can bring something to the conversation that can help a collective discussion that maybe we could reach together some kind of solutions or answers. But I think that whether you're talking about the history of laws, the history of Asian Americans or immigrants or language, I think we actually, as, as scholars um, and professionals, we bring something to the conversation that actually is not always there. So I think that's that's why we do it. Not just so we can add a voice, but so I don't like I don't write about anything that's not historical. I'm not, a, I'm not an elected official, I'm not a public figure. You know, I, that's what I can bring to the conversation is something historical. So I'm very careful not to write about just anything because people ask me to write about all kinds of things. And I don't because I don't think that's really what I can contribute. So I think that's, that's what we have to offer. Well, let's, let's continue talking about history first, and then we'll, we'll turn, of course, and the, the conversations. I'd love to hear your thoughts too on this, Kathy. Um, and in a room full of historians, um, this question might be a bit provocative, but I think it's worth uh, talking about. Is there too much history when we talk about the present day of Asian American anti Asian violence, anti Asian um, sentiment? Some might say that we're talking too much about history, not enough about the present. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Both of your work address the question of history. The obvious answer is no. <laughs> Even if I weren't talking to a rock or a historian, I would say no. Um, uh, you know, I'm with 
culture of Inhuman here. I mean, it's like you, you know, you have to, the past is the present. You bring the past into the present to understand the future, or like, you know, understand what my future is. I think a problem is, uh, I think, like the opposite of that. There's not enough history. And I would say that, especially in this age of digital capitalism, um, you know, it, it had sort of this opposite effect. Uh, everything is archived, but nothing is remembered. Nothing is known. We have this influx or this uh, superfluous uh, information. But that's not actually metabolized into actual knowledge. Uh, and knowledge is uh, what we use as a wisdom to make wise decisions. And there is just, of course, it's insufficient, you know. And um, in terms of, and I would say especially uh, in terms of taking American studies now, we are not thankful to have a story like you who are able to go, like your last book, who are able to kind of uh, even say gold rush and Chinese migration to global uh, racial capitalism. And uh, we need more in depth scholarship like that. And there has been, um, there needs to be more. Um, I was listening to NPR, and this was my experience when I was in high school, like where, you know, there was a, someone was saying this. And I have the same experience where you have an American, you know, you have like a home sized American history book, and um, what was devoted to Asian American history was like a paragraph. And maybe it got a little bit better, but then, you know, even though there is this kind of need to, you know, the paragraph is kind of to a page, now we're seeing, um, you know, right wing America. Fighting against that, you know, just even for a little bit more inclusion, but you know, um, talking about uh, critical race theory and how it's destroying America and, and so forth. So it's it's a constant battle, you know, to really understand. And it's also about just longing, you know. Perhaps we have a lot of history in this room, but I would say, for the most part, if we're talking about a general American audience, if we're talking about younger um, Americans, they don't have access to truth, to what the foundation of America really was. So, you know, um, the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, some of you will know that there's uh, the controversy of the American Historical Association recently where the president wrote a column um, criticizing historians for being presentist. And, um, and what he meant by that was that their, uh, their writings were too, too much shaped by uh, our concerns of the present. And that's actually not what presentism is. <laughs> I'm surprised that he kind of got that a little wrong. Presentism is kind of a sin in the historical profession. And what we mean by that is that we write about the past as though it were the present. Because we all live in the present. Nobody, nobody, including historians, actually lives in the past because it's gone. You're dead. Um, it's over. So we can't go there literally. Um, we go there through archives, through other kinds of textual materials. And the questions we ask are obviously informed by the present because this, this is our time. I can't ask a question based on what people 50 years ago, 100 years ago, I can think about what they might be thinking, but my own subject position is here and now. So there's no way you can avoid being in the present, but that, sh so that always shapes the questions that we ask about the past. So that's not what presentism is. Presentism is when you impose on the past um, a set of uh, conclusions based on the present, and that's a very different kind of problem. So, so this controversy about presentism then spilled over into, you know, um, social media platforms, spilled over into the New York Times, where uh, I won't name names, but somebody said, well, 
we should be talking about why immigrants are being killed and yet people are writing about gold miners. Now, I took that personally, just because I just wrote a book about the gold rushes. <laughs> but my purpose in writing that book was not to supplant any discussion or analysis of what's happening today. If anything, I think people were interested in my book because it helps illuminate the origins of racial ideas about Asians and Chinese. So it was kind of a snarky dig was made, but I think it really confused what historians bring to the table, because we bring something that helps people understand the past, which then can help us understand what kind of choices we have today. It's not so much that it tells us what to do, but my point in that book was to show that racism against Chinese was not something, you know, um, uh, innate in white people that it's, it's not something that's up in the cloud and you can just download the app for anti-Chinese racism anywhere, anytime. You know, it's produced historically by politics. And if it's a political question, then we have, a, and people had choices, right? What kind of political path they wanted to pursue. And so to me, that's my message is that we have a choice today in terms of how we want to see our country go, how we want the world to go. And we have to make that choice. It's a different, different kind of choice, but it's a choice between democracy and white supremacy, or between democracy and authoritarianism. That's our choice today. So I don't have the answer to that, but my purpose is not to supplant any discussion of the present, but um, to, to have history help us have that conversation. We actually had Professor Mai um, serve as a distinguished lecturer of my, the Center for Immigration Law Policy and Justice last fall, but because of the pandemic, we had to have the talk, uh, her lecture, um, through Zoom. And so it's just great to be part of this conversation with the, the two of you. Um, but to continue to talk, as we continue talking about um, history versus presentism, um, Kathy, I wanted to ask you, I you know you, both of you have been doing a lot of talks the last few years on your most recent books. Um, in your, you know, one of your essays, in the third essay, I believe, from your book, White Innocence, The End of White Innocence, I'm struck by how that particular essay helps us to address this question about where does history fit in? Should history fit in in the way that we talk about um, present issues today? Can you just say a little bit more about how you see that particular essay, End of White Innocence, what role that plays in today's discussions about anti-Asian immigrants? how we might understand um, just in general ongoing racial discrimination against people of color. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, 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 you know, End of White Innocence is an essay that doesn't really actually introduce any new ideas. Uh, it's more my own personal kind of, um, kind of entwining my own kind of personal memories with uh, this, this notion of white innocence and um, of course, there are plenty of scholars and historians who have already uh, spoken about white innocence, Paul Baldwin, Mel Painter, uh, you know, any you know, any number, uh, you know, uh, scholars of white studies. Um, but I guess um, what I was, you know, the title is "End of White Innocence," and um, basically, I was uh, kind of. Maybe it's addressing this notion of presentism, but uh, this kind of um, willful ignorance of white America, of understanding only one kind of history, one that is uh, where, I mean, it's basically the white innocence that a lot of these critics of critical race studies want to be taught in schools where, uh, you know, racism was solved and Civil rights movement, the civil rights movement, and everything has been hunky dory since. And in fact, it hasn't been that, um, you know, um, but it's also what I've been taught in school as well, which is, uh, you know, America Foundation was a democracy, slavery ended, everything was, everything was great, and so forth. And, um, and that is also, um, that has also, I guess, um, influenced. 
um, literature too. And um, you know, in the essay, I talk about uh, mid-century American literature uh, by uh, a lot of white authors. Like an example would be John Cheever. I used the example of uh, the Graduate, uh, Mike Nichols, The Graduate, and how many of these movies uh, and um, books sort of uh, see America as a kind of screen memory of nostalgia, you know, and their understanding of, of America is uh, very much about their own childhood, the innocence of their own childhood and how that is vanishing. And, um, and my thinking is like, well, what is that about? Because I didn't have this innocent childhood. And I think innocence is something that is, uh, um, people assume that in, in childhood innocence is universal, but of course it's not. It's based on uh, your socio demographic position, you know, whether you have, it, whether you're black or brown, um, Asian, but also your uh, economic background. And, um, you know, innocence is based on the idea of where you think, you, you know, it's based on the song, free to be you and me, you can be whoever you want, right? And this notion of white innocence had to do with like, I, I could be anyone I want. Therefore, and this is a kind of a worldview that is universal. And, um, and not thinking of whiteness as a racial category. And that has changed, as we have seen, you know, I mean, that is, uh, I think, and that was when, um, especially within the last a few years, especially since like 2016, since the election of Trump, where um, white America has been made aware of their racial identity and being made aware of them, they think it's a form of oppression. And so this is where we have been getting a lot of blowback in politics and so forth. And so that essay was my kind of personal experience, my, uh, my own sort of personal take on that. And I guess my interest was, my interest in that essay was well, what's going to happen to whiteness? You know, and this was actually, I started that essay before Trump got elected, before January 6th, and everything else that has happened since. Um, because, you know, in, in the, like 2040 or so, uh, the minorities will be the majority of America. So, what is, what, how is that going to change racial policy? Is that going to change racial politics? Uh, what um, is whiteness going to be? Whiteness is also very, uh, you know, as we know, it, it's it's malleable, right? You know, Jews and Russians were not white, but um, now they are. You know, will it? Uh, will Asians be white? I don't think so. They, I don't think that's the case. But these are sort of the questions that I grapple with in that essay. Hearing you talk about whether Asians can be white, I'm reminded of uh, the two Supreme Court cases in the 1920s in which the Supreme Court was faced with a question by a Japanese American and a South Asian Indian as to whether they're white. I heard called it the uh, uh, Bagatin versus United States and Ozawa versus United States. And so as the lawyer, law professor, I'll just share a little bit about it and then would love to hear your thoughts about is it possible for the meaning of whiteness to evolve in some ways to incorporate Asians. So in um, in the thin, uh, we'll start with Ozawa, right? Ozawa came first. So in the Ozawa case, um, he argued that he, he asked the court to declare that he's white because if he was a white immigrant, he can apply for citizenship. And at the time, there were only two racial groups who were eligible to apply for citizenship, white immigrants, um, and then after the Civil War, those of African descent were then um, given the opportunity to apply for citizenship. So only those two categories, racial groups. In the 1920s, there, at this time, there were already Chinese immigrants, um, Japanese Americans, and South Asian immigrants, Filipinos, not eligible for citizenship. And so the question was, well, um, that Mr. Uh, Ozawa argued, can I be white because my skin is white? I am I'm arguably white, and so therefore apply for citizenship. And the, the case went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, where it said, no, you're not who we popularly understand as white. Whiteness, uh, being white means you're Caucasian. 
Three months later, another case, a related case, went up before the U.S. Supreme Court. Mr. Thind argued, well, I'm South Asian, uh, high caste Punjabi. I am white. I'm Caucasian. That's scientifically who I am. And the Supreme Court then turned around and said, that's not what we mean by white. Right? A white person is someone who, it doesn't matter if one is scientifically white. Instead, a white person is someone who is conventionally known as white by the framers. And so here I pointed out because judges, Supreme Court justices were instrumental in defining who was white. And then over time, um, in terms of naturalization by 1952, all racial categories to citizenship were limited. But I bring back that um, history because judges, just Supreme Court justices, did, played a crucial role in defining who is white. And I'm just curious in your own work, how, whether once our idea of whiteness, and to go back to what Chancellor Cantor was talking about, who belongs, how racial categories have defined who belongs in America, and where you see your work interrogating that question of who belongs on the basis of race, and where Asian Americans fit in in that question. That's a really important question, Rose, and um, and it's, I think it's really complicated. You know, speaking of the Supreme Court, um, they're going to hear the affirmative action uh, case uh, this term. Um, you're going to hear it very early um, in October. Um, that's the Harvard case, and I think the Harvard case is interesting uh, because uh, it's, it's. I'm sure most of you know, but for those who don't. It's the case that um, Asians, uh, there are too many Asians in Harvard, um, and that uh, it's a discrimination. And, but the, the, the lawyer bringing the suit is the same lawyer who brought the suit against Michigan and Texas on behalf of white plaintiffs that said affirmative action was discrimination against whites. And now they're using Asians as a wedge to suggest that Asians, like whites, are discriminating against Blacks and Latinos. And the interesting thing is that um, uh, Asian Americans, uh, when polled, uh, poll in favor of affirmative action. Um, and then if you break it down by Asian ethnic groups, there's only one Asian group that opposes affirmative action, it's the Chinese. And that's because there is a preponderance of um, wealthy or relatively wealthy um, immigrants from China or Taiwan. Um, but all the other Asian ethnic groups, whether it's Vietnamese or um, uh, Filipino or whatever, they all poll in favor of. Uh, so I think that this is a side note, but I think when we talk about Asian American studies and Asian Americans, we also always have to be mindful that Asian Americans are not homogenous group, that, that there's ethnic differences. And there's also class differences in groups. I mean, not all Chinese are wealthy either. A lot of Chinese work in restaurants and garment factories uh, or, or, or homeless. You know, so we, we have to really pay attention to those details. But I think this is part of the history where Asians uh, never fit comfortably in a society that where race was historically defined um, as black and white. Um, Ellen Wu, who's going to be on a later panel today, has written brilliantly about that position of moving historically from definitively not white to definitively not black. I think that really sums up the, um, the, the fraught nature of Asian Americans' racial position in the American landscape. So these are all things that um, you know, I mean, people, people, one of the things surrounding this more recent wave of uh, violence against uh, Asian Americans is how shocked people are. And that shock is, I think, an index of the, the misconception that Asian Americans don't have any problems, that they're not um, racially othered anymore, that they're white or white adjacent. I put that in quote because I hate that concept of being white adjacent. So I think these are all really complicated questions, and 
um, we no longer rely on the Supreme Court to declare racial categories. Um, this is actually done by the OMB, the federal government, as a list of minorities, and that, that has all kinds of implications for policy. But it's no longer up to the courts to decide uh, what a race is. Uh, and, and the court is, let alone what race any particular person is, like that's no longer something that can be litigated. And so I think identity has um, a much more complicated in some ways valence because it's perception, it's self-perception, um, you know, recognition, misrecognition, custom rather than law is what guides a lot of uh, racial discrimination and policies. Um, so I think we're, we're in, I, I don't know how this is gonna go. I think, you know, my, my general band, what was so, so what was really interesting about those two cases, let me just say this and I'll, I'll stop is that Thind and Ozawa made two kinds of arguments when they went before the court. They made a strict legal argument, which is that I am white. Because that was, well, they could have said I am black, right? Yeah. So it's, it's important that they didn't say that, right? They said, I am white. So Ozawa said, you know, the I knew have very white, they're really white, and Thind said I'm a Caucasian. But that, that wasn't the only argument they made. They also said, I'm an American because I believe in the Constitution. I believe in the principles of this country. So they were careful not to only rely on the racial argument. They had to make that in order to have a, a legal case. But they also made it clear that they were, uh, you know, small d Democrats. They were that they should be included as a matter of democracy. So I think if we, if that's our starting point, that we want to have a democratic society, and we want to redress those things that foster undemocratic norms or inequalities, then I think that's at least a starting point. But I, you know, frankly, I think this whole question of where Asian, I mean, that's kind of what we learn from Kathy in her book, that where do we fit in? Do we fit? We don't fit in. And therefore, we're either invisible or hyper-visible, right? <laughs> and right now, we're kind of hyper-visible. So I think this is, this is our challenge. Uh, I mean, I, what I say in my book is that it's American very conditional um, uh, position where we're uh, tolerated, which is tolerant, you know, tolerance is not the same thing as acceptance, right? Like tolerance is you are, uh, we, we will bear your presence until uh, a circumstance that's often external uh, happens and then, um, and then, the, then the blame is placed on you. And a lot of immigrants are at but in that position quite a bit. And when I talk about Asian Americans, you know, I'm talking about, you know, this has been happening for hundreds of, this is why history is so important, right? Because we know that this has been happening for hundreds of years. And um, the, the most recently, uh, besides, co uh, you know, COVID times so was like, you know, uh, you know, when there was a threat of detaining Muslims or uh, after 9-11 when, um, um, you know, South Asians, Muslim Americans were being targeted uh, for this. So this is cyclical. It happens. It's like musical chairs, which ethnic, which ethnic group are we going to choose next? But and this is and because of this, uh, because uh, Asian Americans have always been in this uh, conditional uh, position. This is my suspicion that I don't think Asian Americans will ever become white. There's always this kind of Carrot and um, you know what Claire's leading to this idea of um, between black and white. I mean, there have been a lot of scholars who've written on this, uh, like Claire Jean Kim, who talked about how Asian Americans have always been in this very tricky, triangulated relationship between blackness and whiteness. You know, where they have always been used as as a wedge, um, um, and we're seeing that. Even now, with the anti-Asian hate, where there's a lot of this um, conflict about the solution, what to do, and um, there are leftist Asian Americans who believe that uh, we have to find non-carceral solutions, and there are more right-wing Asian Americans who believe that we, uh, we need to find carceral solutions, uh, and, and then the 
you know, white right wing pundits uh, grab onto that narrative and use or exploit or not use Asian Americans. They're not um, they have agency. They're doing this too to and use them as a reason for um, 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 blaming uh, Black Lives Matter, defunding police, and all of that. And that has been one long narrative. It's been going on for a long time. And it's uh, sometimes it seems to be comfortable, but uh, we have to, I think what's really, really essential, I don't have like a tactical solution to that, but I do believe that it's really essential for everyone to understand how we ended up in this country in the first place and how we have been on um, these like marginalized groups that have been affected by uh, whiteness, capitalism, whatever, what have you, as a way to, um, you know, uh, as, a, as a means of mind change. What should allyship look like then? So both of you, um, like I'm hearing echoes of the need to engage um, with and, and to collaborate, coordinate with other groups who are also who have been marginalized historically. In Kathy, you said uh, you mentioned Black Lives Matter. What um, Asian American groups have protested, have joined the protests. Um, but I guess you said there are also other. Um, we know that there are other groups who have also joined the other side and Blue Lives Matter. And so there's a need to um, to. Uh, engage with other groups and um, but what what should what would ally what could or should allyship look like from your perspective <laughs> see this is great because we are, we're making sure that we're giving each other space <laughs> may you want to start well i i just want to um i mean i think we should all practice solidarity you know, with our fellow human beings and with other groups who are other racialized. Uh, so I think that's, um, I think that's, that's a political position, but I think it's also a humanist position. Um, that we are, we should be in solidarity with others and we should be, that's what it means to be against racism. Um, but I, but I want to, I want to go back to the point I made a little while ago about how no ethnic group is homogenous. There's different socioeconomic positions, different ethnicities, different politics. And I think, you know, Asians are often described with a very broad brush as being uh, anti black, as being conservative, even re I mean, I had an argument with somebody that said, um, you know, wanting more police was reactionary. I don't, I don't see what, having more police as a solution, but I don't think it's reactionary. I mean, that's very loaded. So I, I think, and just as our communities are not of one mind, the black community is not homogenous either. And um, nor is or Latinos are famously diverse, ethnically and politically. So I, I think there's um, a lot of um, simplistic, thinking um, about uh, race in terms of groups that, first of all, there's the divisions, right, between groups, and then each group is kind of understand as a monolith. So I think, you know, um, part of our education, and I think as Kathy pointed out in, in one of your writings, that it's not a, it's not like a competition, like who's the most oppressed. It's not a competition. I mean, we can recognize what's distinctive in different racisms and what's distinctive in the burdens of history that different groups carry. Um, but it's not a competition. And I think if we if we take an approach that I think at the bottom is a humanist approach, but then is also a political strategy, then I, I think we can say we should all be in solidarity with others. And for me to be in solidarity with, say, Black Lives Matters, you know, I also don't feel like I have to say that before I say something about Asians. I think some of us feel like we have to make it clear we're allies before we advocate for ourselves. And I don't, I, I think that puts us in a really weird position. We have to apologize for um, protesting our own the racism that makes them. We have to apologize for it. 
So it's not one or the other, and I think this is all, you know, what we're having to navigate today. Um, you know, I think one of the complications of Asian American studies or Asian American conversations by a lot of people are uh, also bristle at uh, Asian American anything. Why so many Asian Americans are just Dow on earth? Like it doesn't apply to me. I'm not that. Uh, and um, and I think it's a lot of that is the classic that has happened among um, you know in the news, in what we're taught, in um, in um, entertainment and, and so forth. And going back to the Supreme Court's decision, which I am dreading. Um, you're right. It is the minority of Asian. It's like East Asian Chinese do not. I mean, if you think about even within the Chinese, like as it's off cited that the poorest, one of the poorest ethnic groups are in, in New York is uh, Chinese Chinese immigrants. So it, you know, and uh, Chinese immigrants, but it's the wealthy Chinese immigrants who uh, first generation, second generation, who are and maybe some Koreans in there too, who are pushing for that, you know, um, not that it's not that I, the last time I read it's like 70% Asian Americans who actually do approve of affirmative action, but we don't hear or read about that complexity among Asian Americans. We don't like if we're talking about what we, we don't know enough of, we don't know, we are not, we don't hear anything about like Southeast Asian communities who live in the Midwest, for instance. Uh, but anyway, I don't like going back to your question. Um, I wish there was another word other than allyship. Um, I, I don't know why, but I have problems with that word, allyship. Um, um, I hear it quite often, and I think because I hear it quite often, it's a coined term that has lost its um, kind of urgent luster and is now seems like more. For whatever reason, seems more like uh, virtue signaling, you know. But I think that, like, when we think about as much as I um, understand Asian Americans are the term is so broad and so disparate that there's also a need to disaggregate Asian Americans because what, uh, say, you know, someone who is, you know, Chinese immigrant dishwasher is going through is probably very different than. What um, you know, some uh, someone who works in Silicon Valley. So there is a need to disaggregate it. But like we have to see, I see Asian American, um, and I say this repeatedly, as less an identity and more a coalition. You know, and um, a coalition of very uh, divergent, different groups. You know, who have some who have shared struggles, uh, that, uh, divergent struggles, but also shared struggles. And then it's like really kind of the only way we can sense of, of sort of the mosaic that is Asian America because of all of our differences. And if we see it more as a coalition, then I think it would be easier to understand how that coalition can be built among other immigrants, like other Latinx people, other, you know, uh, uh, Black Americans, Indigenous, and so forth, because it's like a, a patchwork of connections, of these connected nodes that we're making, you know, and there are some among Asian, like I was talking to a friend whose mom who lives, who grew up in Minnesota, and she said she grew up in the projects with other um, Black Americans. She has more in common probably with them, with the people who she grew up with, than, um, the, you know, uh, you know, someone who works in Silicon Valley, you know, so I don't know. I think that um, when we talk about allyship, we think of it as like someone who it seems very sort of superficial to me, like someone who's completely outside the experience, outside one, um, outside one's experience, the other's experience, and trying to kind of 
um, make gestures that are sympathetic and show that they support that person. And I think that's important, but I think it's also important to understand where our shared experiences are and really kind of go from there and think of it as uh, we're not going from, we're not building a bridge from one sort of sealed group to another. I think it's like, it's more important to think of it as that uh, we're all, you know, these different coalitions. I really appreciate that. That's um, such a, it's a helpful way of framing what solidarity could look like among Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. So I, um, the, we, we haven't had the chance to talk about the PI side of that gets incorporated within Asian American studies. Um, but just in thinking about shared experiences, and I really appreciated what, how you just explained that, um, Kathy, because then it also allows us to consider how we might expand that towards the other marginalized and subordinated groups that we can then, as a group, uh, push together for transformative changes that'll advance all of our interests. Um, we have now about 20 minutes left, um, and we wanted to make sure that we gave the audience a chance to ask some questions and participate in the conversation. So why don't I just pause here and give uh, those in the audience a chance to ask questions or feedback or reactions to some of the, the, the conversations we've been having. Um, so many interesting um, points being made here. One of the things that really interested me is something that uh, you said, Mae. Uh, one of the, the things I wanted to follow up with you on, Bay, is uh, when you said uh, many uh, Asians feel that they have to uh, first say Black Lives Matter before they can talk about their own experience of racism. And you said, um, I don't think we have to, you know, basically apologize um, in order to, to to declare our experience. I was wondering if you could expand on that, because you know the, the, the whole apologetic uh, Asian um, stereotype. I think it's, it's, it's right there. Here. It, right. It is there's right. a lot under what that need to apologize. And especially that relationship to to blackness, um, I think, is part of that apology. In one of your writings, you use the term racial management, which uh, uh, which I find a really fascinating term when you're talking about the Chinese Exclusion Act. So, could you unpack the apology for us? Um, thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Paul. Well, I think that we. Um, it's an index of how abject we sometimes are. Um, and I think when, when our choices are invisible or hypervisibility, and um, when you're hypervisible, you want to return to being invisible, right? Because it's safer, right? So, um, uh, so I think there is a stereotype of Asians are always apologizing or troubling things up, messing things up, being complicating things, or you know, being uh, demanding. Uh, so I think there is a stereotype that we're always apologizing. But in fact, historically, Asian Americans have stood up for themselves. They've, you know, they've waged struggles. They workers have gone on strike. I mean, a lot of what I write about is the origins of the Cooley myth, the myth that Chinese are docile and passive. But in fact, Chinese workers have historically organized to improve their wages or their conditions or protest their exclusion from trade unions or, or whatever. So a lot of the, um, I think the stereotype of always being apologetic is connected to the idea that Asians are passive, right? Because if you're passive, then if you uh, try to say something, there's this, there's this uh, reflex to apologize for it first. But I think, you know, I mean, I think it goes back to the exclusion era or the, the time when exclusion politics were, uh, were rife, when, um, uh, you know, if the chart is you don't belong here, you can never assimilate, you can never be an American, then people say, I'm sorry, I'm an American. 
you know, so there's like, I'm sorry, I do belong here. And, and somehow it's hard to separate those things. So I was speaking more of, of a, a contemporary problem where uh, so many people assume that Asians are all privileged that we have to say, you know, uh, we have to apologize first for saying no, we're, we're, we also suffer from racism. So racial management I meant as a kind of legal technique and legal and political uh, form, form of government. So for African Americans, it became, you know, after slavery, famously it became segregation, right? Separate but equal. And for Asians, it was exclusion. So they're different. They're different techniques of of, uh, of, of political kind. But that's what I meant. Um, can I speak to that? Uh, I, I would say that uh, first of all, there are plenty of Asian Americans who are very unapologetic, really loud about. Uh, speaking up about uh, anti-Asian racism um, um, and have it for a long time. You know, there's a long history of that. There are loud, angry Asians. <laughs> um, but I, from what I have experienced, you know, just talking to some Asian Americans, especially younger Asian Americans, but actually, of, you know, all ages, is I've been, um, you know, what I, it's this concern that I've been, pattern of concern that I've heard, which is, uh, is it okay if I take up space? Or is it okay if I, um, um, uh, am I taking up too much space talking about my own, uh, the racism that's against me? And I think that there's this really internalized assumption that Asian Americans, uh, not some, not all, you know, some Asian Americans that I have talked to feel that uh, their the 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 structural racism that they face, whether it's uh, you know microaggressions or real deep down um, um, you know or uh, you know discriminatory practices or being spit on in the street, is not um, uh, it's insufficient. It's not uh, you know serious enough to uh, uh, attract attention and. You know, and there are a number of reasons for that. You could say it's the exclusion act, but I think it's also perhaps sort of the insidious uh, legacy of the model minority myth, which is that uh, there is broad paintbrush where every you know Asians are considered successful when um, the exceptional minority when that has the reality <laughs> can't be further from um, that that uh, the myth. You know, it's actually untrue. Um, but it's something that a lot of Asian Americans internalize. Maybe some of it also comes from family too, you know, that, um, you know, I was reading this great book, Noor al Sadir called Animal Joy. She's a poet and psychoanalyst. And she was just saying something really interesting about sort of uh, the survivor sens uh, sensibility, which is that uh, when you're surviving, when you're trying to survive, you do try to take up as little space as possible. You try to be invisible. You assimilate, you hide, you camouflage. This is what a lot of first generation immigrants do. The most extreme example of that is when, um, you know, they're a gun shooting, right? And someone is, uh, is still alive and they hide, they pretend that they're dead. You know, that's an extreme, um, and dead among other bodies, that's an extreme example of what you do when you need to survive is that you play dead. Uh, and then, but then we see examples of, uh, but another example of that is, uh, you know, the, the refugees or immigrants who come here to the new environment, they have, unlike my parents, have more of a survivor sensibility, which is they assimilate, they just get through it, they get through life. It's not about kind of uh, stirring uh, trouble or anything like that. And it's also possible that there are, you know, second, third generation Asian Americans who have also internalized that sort of immigrant sensibility too, which is that you shouldn't speak up because you're only going to get more into more trouble. So it's, I think it's like kind of double edge. I'm not saying it's, these are not um, totalizing reasons why this is so, nor are there, is this the majority of Asian Americans, but if you hear it, I think it's because of these common assumptions that Asian Americans don't face racism. That's what a lot of people have believed, uh, and probably still believe, despite the anti-Asian hate. 
And, and so that Asian Americans internalize that. And maybe some of it is also coming from family of what generation they happen to be uh, um, in America. I'm reminded, so just to jump in quickly, I'm reminded of one of the speakers that, um, that uh, participated in this panel that Rutgers Law School hosted last spring on anti-Asian violence and how to address that. Jack Chen and I were on the same panel together. And one of the panelists was Liz Kari. She's a, a second gen um, Filipino American whose mother, Vilma Kari, was the one who was assaulted outside of a hotel or an apartment in New York City. And, and it was documented on video. The doorman didn't do anything. And she spoke about how her mother didn't want to do anything. She was embarrassed, her mother was embarrassed to be in the limelight and just kind of wanted to hide. Whereas for Liz, she said, no, 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 we have to speak up, we have to do something. So her story reminds me of what you just uh, shared because there's, there, there is, this, um, for some, an immigrant, an immigrant mentality and then the children saying, we do belong and we have to fight back. And so fast forward to a couple of weeks ago, the two of them um, were invited in the White House and um, President Biden talked about the need to address anti-Asian violence and, um, and her mother is now much more vocal about, um, about ad demanding the fair treatment and asking for governments, um, both federal and state, to address ongoing anti-Asian racism that many are experiencing. Well, Biden just stopped attacking China. That would help. Mm -hmm. To say that. <laughs> well, I think Biden talks out of both sides of his mouth. I don't doubt that he's sincere uh, when he says he's against violence and hatred against Asians. But since the Biden administration continues Trump policy that considers China a strategic adversary, um, that fuels that same violence that he disavows. And I think that you know the competition between the United States and China today is um, uh, very intense, and it, it can only lead to bad things. Among them, more hatred against Asian Americans. That's not even the primary thing. But from where we sit, of course, we we feel that target on our back. But I think that you know um, the path that both uh, Trump and Biden, on the one hand, and Xi Jinping on the other, are pursuing uh, will will lead to no. Hi, thank you for this conversation. My name is Tish Kim. I'm a postdoc here at Rutgers. Um, I have two separate thoughts that I want to share and, and leads to a question. Um, one of the things that I think has been very limiting for me for from um, a person who is undocumented and also a migrant scholar is that the conversation on anti-Asian American is that hyphenated American, right? So when we think about these racial violence and in our contemporary moment against Asian Americans, I think sometimes the conversation leaves out people who are minoritized within Asian American conversation, which are non-Americans, right? Who are refugees, who are asylum seekers, who are undocumented, or who are in the process of trying to become quote unquote American in a legal sense, right? So I think I wanted to sort of hear a bit more on that tension even within Asian people, which is a racial category. Like what, how, how do we sort of incorporate and change or shift this conversation on anti-Asian American hate when the attack is racialized, right? And another complication I think I see and that I've been having conversation with colleagues and community members is that when we think about the mobilization around Black Lives Matter, the arbiter of violence is very much the state, right? Or even white vigilantes, right? Whereas Asian American attack or attack against Asian people are not always necessarily state enforced, right? It's not necessarily always the police, right? Um, I think I want to sort of expand the conversation on like how do we manage those scalar differences around racial violence uh, feels very tricky for me that I haven't really found a good way to approach, not only like within the conversation between Asian communities, but even intra or interrace conversations, right, um, has been a tricky one. My second question is a bit more of an academic conversation. I think I wanted to sort of 
want to ask both of you, where do you sort of see the change in, or hopefully a change in the conversation around Asian American scholarship to include Black and Indigenous conversations, right? Like when we think about incorporation or belonging, I think right now I sort of see a shift in Black studies and Indigenous studies where they're having more of a conversation with each other, whether it's a, a historical or even cultural or contemporary mobilization. And I'm trying to figure out where Asian or Asian American studies fit into that, right? Like there is a slight movement towards reckoning with what does it mean to be a settler as an Asian immigrant, uh, but I don't always see the conversation across like Black, Indigenous, Asian experiences and immigration history. That was a lot. <laughs> point you know we all we all kind of um are reduced to these shorthand phrases like anti-asian hate asian american and they become a shorthand or a stand-in for all the diversity uh, in our groups and i think that uh for asian i mean i consider asian americans to include immigrants okay? um, i don't i don't limit the idea because in part it's a coalitional idea um, not it's not actually a racial identity um, uh, so when i use asian american and i don't use a hyphen in my own practice um, i include immigrants like first generation immigrants in that but i think it, it does become murky because when we write we you know we can't have like a two sentence parentheses you know to explain everybody that you're talking about and resort to these short things. So I don't know what the solution to that is, but some of it is I think when you actually then are writing something that you can unfold in a way that makes it clear that you're talking about diverse groups and diverse communities and citizens of the same city. Um, on the second point, what was the second question? Uh, oh, about scholarship. Well, you know, I think that Okay, so this is where presentism <laughs> comes in, because I think, you know, um, I think I think you should study what you think is interesting to you yourself. You. And I think that there there are there are there are people who work on kind of um, especially in urban studies, urban history, who work on um, projects that are not limited to one ethnic. Um, and uh, sometimes they involve um, histories of coalition politics um, or differences even. Um, but like any, any academic research that involves, that, that gets broader is more research you have to do, right? So you have to learn about all those other things. So that's why, you know, it's, it's daunting. So I would say you shouldn't be forced, right? Um, and I think that, you know, um, I mean, it depends if you're talking about historical scholarship or contemporary research. I mean, a lot of um, people I know who are in the social sciences are very interested in intergroup relations. And I think that's entirely uh, a good thing. And that's a positive thing. Histor when you do historical research, I think you have to just figure out like what is your what is your subject and how does, I don't think you should feel compelled to look for something that crosses over into other groups. That's just, that's my view. But if you want to do that, then, you know, I have a student now who's finishing her dissertation and she writes about health activism in Chinatown after World War, in the post-World War II years. And it's mostly about um, China, China, Chinatown residents but it's also about um, medical professionals who immigrated from Taiwan who have actually become quite active in, in Chinatown. But she's also um, brings in as kind of um, not as not as principal actors, but she's also aware of and, and mindful of uh, and thinks a little bit about the other act health activism that was going on in New York at the same time because the Black Panthers had their free clinics and the Young Lords Party took over 
you know, Lincoln Hospital. I mean, so there are these movements going on, and because and the people at the time work with each other. So it's not so much that she's looking for connections to impose on her story. It's actually part of the story that the activists were actually all engaged in coalition building together. So I think that's a more organic way of approach. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think you raised very important point, multiple points. Um, and thank you for that. And um, I agree with you. I do think there is not enough conversation about undocumented um, Asian migrants. Uh, there's a little bit more about refugees, uh, not enough about undocumented Asians. And for me, my uh, general, uh, you know, my general idea, or it's a very basic one about the future of Asian American conversation is that we have to constantly center and highlight uh, uh, the groups who are the most vulnerable among us. And so far, I think, you know, if we're basing it on headlines, it seems to be more based on um, the uh, affirmative action and um, yeah, those who are anti affirmative action, which are Asian Americans who are very privileged and who happen to be East Asian. And what gets buried are uh, the groups who are living under under various circumstances, conditions such as refugees, uh, immigrants who, uh, you know, um, you know, immigrants, working class immigrants, and undocumented Asians. And I also, this is a question that I bring up. I am not a scholar, so I can't come speak to, uh, uh, or a political organizer, so I can't speak to what the conversation is going on. I can only speak as a poet. Um, but um, I have noticed a, a dearth in that conversation. It needs to be emphasized. And I, I also don't understand why, you know, undocumented uh, the uh, struggle is really centered in um, Latinx studies and not Asian American studies. Because undocumented, there are a, like a, a big um, proportion of undocumented migrants who are also of Asian ethnicity. And that is something that we need to seriously address. There are definitely writers who are like um, a friend, Chen Julie Wang has written a book called Beautiful Country. And um, that's, an, um, that's about her life growing up undocumented. And I think that is like a really important book where it's a personal account that raises uh, really essential, essential Issues. I mean, if we're talking about who is invisible, it's not Asian American. I mean, Asian American undocumented workers are truly, truly invisible, and that was also brought to light. For instance, um, during the Atlanta massacre, right, with the sex workers who were undocumented, and there's just no conversation about that. There's no conversation about that, and I think that, um, um, and there has been more. There has been more, but I, what I found sort of frustrating in the aftermath of that uh, there weren't, there wasn't any, it was more about the number of people who died and not about uh, the structural circumstances that led to their uh, killing. Um, so that needs to be very addressed. What was your second question? It was just sort of about the conversation on Asian American literature or history, like how it should change to incorporate Black and Indigenous culture. Well, I think it is changing, you know, and I, again, I can't speak as a scholar, I'm, I'm speaking as a writer, as a poet, and I'm actually seeing um, where, you know, I can be very cynical about American politics, where I'm not cynical, where I'm actually very hopeful about is what's happening in poetry. And um, so I can only speak to that. And I think that there is actually a lot of uh, support and um, coalition building and cross-racial solidarity about the story of, of, of about the story of you know, it's been going on in poetry for a little while. You know, there's been a renaissance of Black poetry, Latinx poetry, Asian American poetry. And unlike may, maybe politics or scholarship, I'm not sure, there's a lot of like uh, overlapping circles where um, people support each other. There's not that same kind of stylification that you're seeing in other, uh, in other disciplines. So um, I am seeing that. Um, in terms of scholarship, now this is me speaking as an outsider, you know, uh, uh, 
for you. Um, I will say that I personally, I am interested, and this is where, uh, where I think, uh, you know, say Asian American studies could go and is going towards there is just um, cross racial discipline, which I think there's also, if we're talking about what we're not seeing enough of, um, you know, what I find frustrating is, and that might so, sort of be a solution, not a solution, but address some of the conflicts that we're seeing now is that there has been a long history of cross racial solidarity between Asian and Black Americans. An example, if you look at labor history, like um, um, Filipino migrant workers, and like, you know, Mexicano. Uh, workers in uh, the mid century who went on strike against Dole, you know, that's one example. Or, like, you know, you were mentioning in a previous conversation that we had had about Frederick Douglass and how he uh, spoke out against um, the Chinese Exclusion Act. There are very important moments of cross racial solidarity that are centered around uh, uh, labor or immigration acts, but people don't know that history. People aren't interested in that history. Like people were involved, so that I think it like that needs to be amplified uh, more. And then I think there's a lot, of, uh, there's a lot of uh, scholarship that can be had about that. And I think we are seeing more of that too, based on some of the books I see that are about to be published. Yeah, one of my favorite books in this area that um, highlights the um, experience of undocumented Asians is um, Jose Antonio Vargas's book on oh, Divine yes. American. He was just here a few years ago. And one of, the, one of the quotes that I always remember that is so profound is he said, we are here because you were there, because the state, United States was there in all these other countries. And that kind of, um, that, uh, that statement alone helps explain some of why um, many immigrants are here, why they are undocumented, and it offers a space for engaging in, uh, in, in cross-racial solid, cross solidarity. There's so much more that we can talk about, but I'm afraid we're out of time, and I can see the food over there, and um, I can hear my own stomach grum grum grumbling. So um, please join me in thanking our speakers today. May I